women's month, and we look forward to our guest preacher coming next Sunday. I uh, wanted to uh, preach again on one of the women in the Bible. Today we're looking at a passage of scripture. Uh, we looked at a passage of scripture in Joshua, the second chapter. Uh, I hope that you read it at home, read it again just a few moments ago, and we're going to uh, make reference to a lot of things that are in here. We do not read the whole second chapter, uh, but it, it is the story is in the second chapter, and then it continues actually in chapter six. In chapter six, so when you get home tonight uh, during halftime, you want to make sure that you read uh, not only uh, chapter two, but read again chapter six. It gives you the continuation of the story about this woman whose name is Rahab. <clears throat> Joshua is an Old Testament uh, book. Uh, it is uh, one that talks about uh, the, uh, the, the people of Israel as they come to the promised land, the land that God had promised to them and that God was going to give to them. It wasn't a, a place where they're just going to walk in and say, hey, we're here because God said that we're here, but it's one they were going to have to fight for. And so this story begins the story of their fighting uh, to move into the land that God had promised to them. We've already read, and we thank uh, Reverend Floyd uh, for reading, reading us in reading uh, from uh, Joshua, the second chapter. I want to read again for our hearing Joshua, the second chapter, verse number one. Joshua, the second chapter, verse number one. And again, reading from the New International Version. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab. Stay and stay there. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In the precious and loving name of Jesus, and for his sake we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to use as a tag for this message today, a good woman with a bad reputation. A good woman with a bad reputation. Let me say this even first. Uh, this past week I posted on, my, on one of my social media pages this statement. It says that everyone is fighting a battle that we do not know anything about. Be kind, always. Everyone is fighting a battle that we don't know about. Be kind. Always. Sometimes we get caught up in ourselves and in our own sense of self-righteousness that we forget that everyone, each one of us here today under the sound of my voice, is fighting some battle that we don't know anything about. Be kind. Always. Rahab creates a problem for us. Because I know all of us in here saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And all of us have always done what is right, what is expected, what is, what is, what is uh, normal uh, conduct for those of us. As a matter of fact, it's really problematic that we have to read about Rahab in the Bible. We just, we, you know, Rahab is just a different kind of person. That's the language we use. You know. She was just different. And in that difference, it creates problems for us. And, and, and Joshua, in the second chapter, starts off telling us up front what part of the challenge is with Rahab. Rahab, as it says, I'm not making this up, is a prostitute. Rahab is a prostitute. Now, I've seen some commentaries who try to dress it up, saying she really was just an innkeeper. <laughs> And uh, there are a whole lot of ramifications that we can say about what end she was keeping, okay? <laughs> but, but we can, and they try to say that she was just a hostess of it. And they try to fix it. No! But there's nothing in the Bible that fixes it. They just call her as she is. 
Rahab is a prostitute. That's the one we're talking about today. Oh, but that's not the only uh, transgression of Rahab. Because if you go down to verses 4 and 5, you see that not only is Rahab a prostitute, but she's a bold-faced liar. Matter of fact, in those two verses, 4 and 5, she tells uh, five different lies in just two verses. She's, she's a professional liar. <laughs> she knows how to lie. She, she, she practices this, you know. And perhaps because of her profession, she's had to uh, uh, hone in on her lying skills. She was a liar. She also was a woman who was a Canaanite. Woman who was foreign and alien to those who were the Israelites. As a matter of fact, she they were all enemies with one another, as the rest of the story would tell us. Rahab creates problems for us. Sometimes we want to dress it up and try to make because of the fact that you know she's in the Bible, we miss her in the Bible, and she's an important figure in the Bible. We'll talk more about that later. But really, we want to just say, okay, that's Bible language, so we can just talk about her, and we don't have to look at what her real, her real situation is. And in Bible conversation, it's good. We can talk about it. We can talk about how she went and hid the spies, as the text tells us today. But in real time, if your friend was Rahab, <laughs> would you be comfortable bringing her to church with you? If your friend was Rahab, would you invite her to your sorority and, and to be a sorority member of you? Rahab was your buddy, your ride or die, as you would say in some other context. Would you feel comfortable bringing her to some of the social settings you would bring her and allow her to engage in conversation? Can you imagine how that conversation goes? Come stand up for a moment. I don't know what they're saying, okay? <laughs> Story, we can see that she hid the belt. 
And when she hid the devil, the king of Jericho sent some people said, hey, we heard some spies came here. And, uh, and Rahab said, no, they didn't come here. I know, I mean, they came, but uh, they left right before it got dark. And y'all went out this way, you can find them and catch them. Then after they left, Rahab went to talk with the spies. and said, okay, listen, I helped you all. Y'all got to help me too. I know that y'all got a powerful God. I know that God is a good God. I know all the things he's done and he has done for you when you all were getting away from Egypt, when you were crossing into the, the, crossing the Red Sea, going into the wilderness. I know about your God. Because he's a powerful God, I know he's going to help you to uh, have it to take over this land. However, since that's going to happen, you need to help me out too. Help a sister out, if you will. What I need you to do is to assure that my family is going to be taken care of. That we're not going to suffer the devastation that's going to happen to the land. That, that as you, as we have watched, as I've watched over you, that I need you all to watch over my family and me as well. And they said a deal is a deal. They said, okay, you do what you say you're going to do. Don't tell nobody about what our plans are. Don't, uh, uh, and don't go around talking about the fact that we were here because of the fact you protected us. We'll protect you as well. Make sure all of your families here at the house, though, when the invasion comes. And when your family gets here, I need you to make sure that you have the scarlet cord that is hanging from your window. We'll make sure that you're taken care of and our families and your family's taken care of, and we'll be able to do what it is God has called us to do. They made this arrangement with this good woman, even though she had a bad reputation. What is it that we can learn about Rahab that can help us to know about her being a good woman and even though she had a bad reputation? First of all, she was a good woman because she was a part of God's plan. She was a part of God's plan. And she was not a part of the original plan of God. That was not what God had intended. Matter of fact, the original plan of God started some 40 years before. God had told the people of Israel, now listen, y'all can come out of Egypt, I need y'all to head on over to the promised land, and you'll be able to take care of, the, uh, uh, take hold of the land that I have called for you to possess. It should have taken them 11 days to walk from Egypt over to the promised land. Some two, 300 miles the distance would, distance would have been. But because of their obstinance, because of their rebellion, because of their choosing not to do what God had already designated for them to do, instead of taking them 11 days, it took them 40 years to get there. That, was, that is what God's original plan was for them. But now that Moses was dead, Joshua was in charge. Joshua said, we're going to now do what it is God had designated for us to do. And we're going to go and possess the land. So this is how Rahab became a part of the story. When Joshua sent the spies and they stayed at her house, she made this arrangement with them. God included her in the plan. Here it was! This prostitute, oh, we can go and call her what she is. She's a hookup. <laughs> we, can talk, we, can, we can talk about what she was all about, but, but if this woman, with all of this vice, that we associate with her, this woman, with all of her lying and other kinds of things, this woman, who was a part of God's plan. What that tells us is even though sometimes people may say ugly things about you, even though they may call you anything but a child of God, even though you may have some challenges, you've made some mistakes in your life, even though you've made some choices that your parents are not always proud of, even though you've done some things, said some things, sometimes your language is a little saucy. Sometimes your, 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 your disposition is not quite other. Even though all those things may be true, we must still understand that God still uses you as a part of God's plan. That's, that's why it's beautiful. Because God can speak to all of us as a part of God's plan. That's, that's why we're here. That even with, with our disagreements, even with our discord, even with all that we are, God still desires for us to be a part of God's plan. You may have been in the church all your life. I've been in the church all, literally all my life. Joined the 
my church at six. Uh, but, but even if I've been there for these 60 some odd years, or if you just joined and came to Jesus within the past year or so, God still wants to use us as a part of God's plan. <coughs> Year 2022, the, uh, the NFL draft, the National Football League draft, uh, was in place. The, the NFL draft selects 262 persons uh, during its draft, during its annual draft. Year 2022, the very last person who was chosen was a man whose name is Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy. There were 261 other people who were chosen before Brock Purdy. But when the 262 San Francisco 49ers said, well, we got one more draft to us. What are we going to do? And they said, okay, why don't you just get that quarterback from Iowa State? And they said, whatever. They didn't think he was going to make the team. They didn't think he was going to be able to do anything. Brock Purdy was the last person. Matter of fact, they got a title for the person who's the last person chosen in the draft. It's called Mr. Irrelevant. Mr. Irrelevant. In other words, they say he ain't relevant under any circumstance. He was the last man picked in the draft. Made the cut in terms of the team, third string quarterback. But during the course of his rookie season, he was able to win enough games to get San Francisco 49ers to the divisional, uh, to, to the divisional uh, rank of the, of the playoffs. His second year, which was last year, he took the San Francisco 49ers to the Super Bowl. They didn't win, but at least they got there sooner than somebody else's team uh, have gotten there. Okay. <laughs> but the reality of it is that here it was, this one who was counted as being irrelevant was able to demonstrate his relevance because he was a part of the plan of San Francisco. I tell you that to say that also all of us have our relevancy in terms of God. There's something that God has in store for each one of us, something that God is trying to do for each one of us. You may have been counted out by others. You may have been antagonized by others. You may have had all the things said about you, but the reality of it is God is still using you as a part of God's plan. She's a good woman. She had a bad reputation. But she was part of God's plan. Second thing we keep in mind about Sister Rahab is not only was she a part of God's plan, but she was a good woman because she had core values. She had core values. We, we may be uncomfortable about the kind of uh, employment. She was self-employed. She was a businesswoman, okay? Uh, <laughs> but we may be uncomfortable about what she did for them. We may be uncomfortable about the lies. There's a whole other sermon I could do about the lies in and of themselves. Because I oftentimes when hear folk talk about the fact I never lie. I never lie. I think, let me say it now while I'm thinking about it. Um, we say, no, I, I never lie. I'm always telling the truth. Well, that may not always be the truth. <laughs> because, because sometimes you go over and ask somebody, how you doing, thinking she may be feeling kind of poorly, but she's going to say, oh, I'm feeling fine. That's a lie. <laughs> I'm not saying it in her case, but in the case of, of some of us, as, as we do that. If, if someone comes through the church door and they got a gun in their hand, they say, we're looking for the pastor. You need to lie at that point. <laughs> You tell them he ain't here, he left. Go that way, nothing for him. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes there are those situations, and, and as I did my research on that, we're not suggesting that you all be liars. We're not suggesting that you ought to uh, be bearing false witness and, and, and not telling the truth. But sometimes there are, there's evil that does not deserve the truth from you. There's evil that, that causes that, that, that are looking to hurt and harm others that are trying to do someone in that do not deserve the truth. Somebody comes kicking at your door asking for your child. Uh, you're not going to let them in. You're going to say whatever's necessary to get them away. Sometimes even taking the brunt of the punishment yourself. You understand what I'm saying? That's not justifying lying. But it's helping us understand the context that what Rahab was doing was trying to help to help the situation so these spies would not be killed and so they would be able to fulfill that which was God's plan. Rahab had core values. Her core values included her developing a belief in God. Even though she was a Canaanite, 
even though she was a part of another culture. They had several gods that they worshipped, but, but she had the kind of flower to be able to look and to see the testimony about the God of Israel. Yeah. She talked about the fact that he was a God. That was able to bring the people from Egypt into the, uh, the, the wilderness. She knew how the Lord had provided for them uh, in the wilderness, how it was he helped them to cross with the Red Sea. She, she understood the power of the hand of God. She heard the story. She looked on Facebook. She looked on Instagram. She looked at all those places and saw what kind of things God could do. She made up in her mind that if ever the opportunity would present itself whereby she can uh, honor that God, she would do it. So when these spies came, and they were the people who were the, of the God of Israel, she developed a relationship with them to tell them, I know that you have a powerful God. And I want to be a part of that community that's a part of that, that God. My question to you is, what would be your testimony about God? What would you be to tell others about what the Lord has done, what the Lord is doing in your life? What, what is it that is there? That you can say, I know that the Lord has done this. That causes you to speak with conviction, to speak with boldness about the God that you serve. Do you come to worship just because this is your routine? Or do you come to worship because of the fact that you know we've got a powerful God? We may not have power in terms of our lights in this sanctuary, but the power of God is still present in this sanctuary. I'll confess, I pulled my power aside earlier and I told him, I said, this we may have to change the order of worship because we ain't got no lights. He said, Pastor, what do you decide? Just let me know. I pulled Sister Lewis aside. I said, this we may have to change the order of worship because we ain't got no power in here. And uh, she said, Pastor, let me know whatever we decide to do is okay with them. So I went back and looked at the order of worship and I ran back in here. I said, Dr. Power, no, we're not changing anything. Sister Lewis, we're not changing anything. Just because we don't have electric power doesn't mean we cannot have a full worshiping experience. In this because we have a God who is a powerful God. That's a part of her core value. She knew that God was a God. Therefore, you shouldn't get in the way of a God who is a powerful God. The other core value she had is that of fair. Listen again, if you will, to what she said. She said, listen, when, when your folk come in here, I want you to spare my family. Spare my father, spare my mother, spare my brothers and my sisters. Spare all those who are part of our family so that they could come and they can, they can, they can, uh, they can be saved. Mm -hmm. And they sure will be willing to spare your family. She had a value on her family. Even regardless of what her trade may be. Sometimes we're so judgmental about what others are doing. We don't remember that they also have values. Yeah. Every person who's experienced a homeless that you see on the street has a family somewhere. Yeah. Family may have rejected them, family may have put them out, but they still have a family somewhere. Yeah. Everyone who's experiencing some difficult aspects of their lives a family somewhere. Somewhere along the line that somebody's identified and associated with them. Ray had never lost sight of their family. They have never lost uh, on a perspective of what it means to be in family. Matter of fact, even if you're, you're a person, a single person who doesn't have any family in the latter era, you got a family. Your family is called Friendship Baptist Church. That's your family. These are the ones who are going to look after you, they're going to walk with you, they're going to pray with you, they're going to encourage you, they're going to stand with you. That's what your family does. We've got core values. Core values are understanding that you got an almighty God. Core value in terms of understanding that you have family. One final thing I want to suggest to us, as we look at this whole business of a good woman with a bad reputation. Not only was she a good woman because she was part of God's plan. Not only was she a good woman because she had core values. But she also was a good woman because she was redeemable. Because she was redeemable. Oh, you say, okay, that's a nice churchy word, but I just used it. <clears throat> we mean, redeem means to be reclaimed. Yes. That you're able to be brought back in. You're able to be exchanged for something of value. And Rahab was redeemable. Sure, she was a prostitute. 
Sure, she was a liar. Sure, she was a foreigner who was not under the same guise as that of the God of Israel. Sure, perhaps had other things going on in her life. Whatever that may have been, God was able to provide a way for her to be redeemed. How did he do it? Said, the spy said, listen, I want you to take a piece of scarlet cord and I want you to tie it around Tied around the window. So when people, when our people come to the land, they'll be able to know that you are the family of Rahab, the family that God is seeking to redeem. When you see the scarlet cord, that's to let them know that you're okay. And that God is on your side. Everybody came to worship today. Should have got a scarlet pole. Because that is to remind us that yes, I know you've been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I know that many of us have already been baptized. I know that many of us have already connected with the Church of Jesus Christ. And yes, that was your redemptive experience. But every now and then, the things that happen in our lives that we still need to be redeemed, be redeemed from. Sometimes we have to be redeemed from bad relationships. Sometimes we have to be from toxic environments. Sometimes I can be redeemed from poor decisions. Sometimes I can be redeemed from other kinds of things that are happening going on in our lives. But what you've got in your hand right now is a scarlet cord that's to remind you that God is on your side. Remind you that there's always a way out of no way. Remind you that you can make it no matter what circumstance you find yourself in. You've got your scarlet cord. It's your scarlet cord that gives you the courage to wake up every morning. Scarlet cord that reminds you that you can go on anyhow. Though ominous clouds may be over your head, you can still make it because you've got your scarlet cord. I know you can make it because I'll be having God who provides a way out of no way. I know you can make it because we have a God who gave us his son Jesus, Mr. Christ, who sees our scarlet cord and knows that we are those who need to be the beneficiaries of his grace and of his mercy. Every time you look at your scarlet cord, you are reminded of the fact that you had the Son of God who died for your sins, died for my sins, died for your wickedness. Died for my wickedness. You, you got a scarlet cord that reminds you that he was crucified on a cross in a place called Calvary. It reminds you of the fact that he was buried in a tomb because of your sins and my sin, because of your wickedness and my wickedness. But I'm so glad that my scarlet cord reminds me that even though I have done things wrong, that that is not the end of the story. Really, that's Sunday morning. Early, while the dew was still on the roses. Early, early, before the hustle and bustle of a new day. Early, yeah. that Sunday morning, Jesus got up out the grave yeah. and claimed all power yeah. in the palm of his hand. Yeah. That's why when I rise in the morning, yeah. I'll always say thank you, Lord, for another day. I say thank you, Jesus, for letting my days go on just a little while longer. I've been redeemed. By the Lord, I've been reclaimed by God, and I know that He will never abandon me, nor will ever forsake me. She was a good woman, good woman. We're not going to invite her to homecoming next week. <laughs> she was a good woman. She was a good woman. She had a job that we don't tell people that you ought to ascribe to. We don't tell our children you know you need to ascribe to as you decide what your career choice is going to be. But, but she was a good woman. She was a good woman because God chose to continue to use her as part of God's plan. She was, she was a good woman because in spite of her career choice, she still had, she still had uh, core values. She was a good woman. Because she was redeemable. But there's one other thing I've got to say. Not to another point, but I got to just say this as a footnote.
Because you go over to the Gospel of, of Matthew. Rahab name pops up again. Rahab had a son whose name was Boaz. And you know that Boaz was the husband of Ruth. Ruth got a book in our Bible. But we don't stop the story there. If you look on down a little further in Matthew, the first chapter, you see that Rahab was the great, great grandmother of David, who was the greatest king in all of Israel. If you head to Israel right now, you see a lot of things talk about King David. Rahab, who was the great, great grandmother of the greatest king of all of, of, of Israel. But then you go down a little further. 28 different generations. You find again that she that, that, that Rahab is related to somebody else. That she is Jesus' uh, uh, ancestor. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, Rahab, this prostitute. Rahab, this liar. Rahab, this woman. Rahab, this woman that we don't want to identify with. She is one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. You never know what God has in store. You never know what the future may hold. You never know what God's plan is. We just have to make ourselves available. Allow ourselves to be redeemed in such a way that we can see how God is going to make a way out of no way. Amen. Amen.